I think we are ready to start now. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Robbie. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about all the maneuvering there. <laughs> it's okay. We got it. Uh, well, first I, I do, I want to say hello to everyone and thank you. Thank all of you for making the time in your schedules to attend GSA's um, and CBP's invol public involvement meeting regarding the environmental review portion of the proposed Alcan Land Port of Entry construction project. The environmental review portion of this project is under the National Environmental Policy Act, which is, um, you'll hear it referred to as NEPA throughout this presentation. And also our consultant, Saul, will explain later in the presentation how NEPA ties in to, uh, to this proposed um, construction project at Alcan. Next slide, please. And so my, my name is Emily Grimes and I serve as GSA's Region 10 Environmental Program Manager. And for this environmental portion, environmental review portion, I will be serving as a project manager um, under the NEPA program. And so I do just wanna briefly go over what Region 10 is so you get a better um, feel of what we cover. So Region 10 under GSA covers Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And for the current projects that we have um, at, and under this uh, land port of entry program is, is only in the states of Washington, Alaska, and Idaho. And today our focus is in Alcan, Alaska. And I'll let the uh, other GSA members and then Solve introduce themselves. Hello everyone. My name is Aaron Evanson. I'm a federal uh, construction project manager. And I am kind of hurting all the cats, as it were, for uh, the LPOE modernization at Alcan. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Gant. I'm the Regional Historic Preservation Officer for GSA, and I'm responsible for making sure we take cultural resources into account for this project. And then we have Saul. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm Rick Rocco. I'm the Capital Projects Branch Chief. And so under that, it covers these uh, LPOE projects uh, at Alcan and the other ones in Washington and Idaho. Uh, yeah, Leon Kolenkevich. I'm a longtime environmental planner and NEPA practitioner with Solv LLC as well as a former Alaska resident and former employee of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. I've also done a lot of uh, consulting with the National Park Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Alaska. Robbie? And I'm Robbie Baldwin. I am the project manager on the solve side of this project as well. And I'm, I'm a NEPA practitioner and a wildlife biologist and economist by uh, training. All right, thank you everyone. And so I do want to, you know, go over the um, purpose of having this public meeting um, for, and it is, it's, it's mainly for informational purposes and to involve everyone, the public and other agencies for GSA to share in, um, the current information we have. And I do want to, you know, stress on that everything we have right now, it is um, preliminary, nothing is set in stone. We're in a deliberative phase. And so any comments, any feedback that you can provide us after this presentation, after you get a chance to review the handouts that are posted in the, in the chat, um, please, please do. It can, whether you can also uh, share positive comments as well, we love those, but also any concerns that you may have. But we really just wanna be able to take this time to share information and, and give a better um, uh, answer, hopefully to anything, any concerns that somebody may have, or just, you know, bring knowledge to everyone that does attend. And then it's important to know too, is that any comments that you do um, provide to us, that those do get gathered and we do review those, those are summarized and those get reviewed by GSA, by CBP, along with Solve, and we will address those, that is our goal to address those in um, the environmental impact statement, which you'll refer, you'll see referred to as the EIS throughout this presentation as well, which is all part of the NEPA process. And then I do wanna just point out that the meeting is being recorded with closed captioning. Um, so if you have any issues with, with utilizing closed captioning, please you know, put it in the chat and someone will assist you. But what I can see so far, it, hopefully it's at the bottom of your screens where you can show closed captionings or you can hide it. Um, you have the choice. 
But then also I do, um, you'll see it throughout the presentation as well, is to, you know, please refrain from separately recording this presentation. And it's mainly because we will be uploading it to the Alcan project webpage, which the link is right here. And you'll be able to go back over and listen to anything. And also I encourage you to share it. If anyone didn't get a chance to, to come to attend this meeting, or if you feel like maybe somebody should have attended this meeting, I please do encourage you to share it with them. Um, well, that's what we want. We wanna involve as, as many as we can um, who, who care about what we're proposing to do here. And then also for submitting your comments, um, we will open up, or we're going to go through the presentation first, and then at the end of the presentation, we're going to open up the, the floor, the virtual floor for people to start making comments. We're, we're starting with at least providing everyone a maximum of two minutes to speak, but based off of time and how much we have, we can always circle back. And so we don't feel, we don't want anybody to feel like you got cut off or you lost your chain of thought. And I do encourage you even before waiting um, until until speaking at the during the comment period, you can utilize the chat box because that's where we will refer to you first just to go down that line um, to see if anybody chatted anything. And then we'll also open it up to um, people just wanting to speak off the cuff as well. Next slide, please. Okay, and just to, to go over the agenda and the layout of this meeting, we'll be having, we'll start with um, General Services Administration's role, so GSA's role, and then Aaron uh, will go over the project background, and then we'll have Saul go over the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, and then Kim will also address how the National Historic Preservation Act ties in with NEPA as well, and then from there, that's what we'll conclude and start opening up for um, everyone to submit comments. And then I'll also go over all the options that are available to submit comments. We wanted to make it as easy as possible and not difficult for anyone. Hopefully, um, that comes across. Next slide, please. And then we did add in acronyms because we will be using those quite a bit and we will try um, our hardest to, to remember to, to say the whole word entirely and not use the acronyms initially all the time. But if you need to go back at any time and even afterwards when it gets posted, please um, refer to our acronym slide. Okay, so I wanted to just go over um, the mission of GSA. And so our mission is to deliver the best customer service and value in real estate acquisition and technology services to the government and the American people. We also provide centralized procurement for the federal government, which introduce, which includes offering services and facilities that federal agencies need to serve the public. And by this, we also help federal agencies build and acquire office-based products and other workspace services, which includes overseeing the preservation of historic federal properties, which Kim Gant will talk about later. And since this is just a very generalized overview of GSA's mission and background, I, I did include in here, and I do encourage everyone, if, if, if possible, to visit our webpage. It, it really does give better insight on our evolution and how GSA um, was created under President Truman in 1949 and how we've come so far from the services and, and our missions and our, and our visions um, since then. So I highly do encourage that. And then so I do want to also go over some maybe thinking how the how these projects came about and just briefly hopefully um, to hopefully take away any confusion or if you had any questions. There's a bipartisan Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which is the BIL, you, you'll hear refer to that sometimes. And it was signed back on November 15th, 2021 by President Biden. And it was intended to in, um, investment in our, in our nation's infrastructure, competitiveness, and communities. And it's managed by the Land Port of Entry Program, which provides those funds that will be used to modernize and improve land port of entries at uh, both northern and southern borders. And so GSA's role in this in this process is because we um, at Alcan we um, GSA owns the the property there and some of the buildings and CBP also owns some buildings there as well, but GSA's role in utilizing those funds is where we were um, we'll, we'll utilize 3.4 billion to fund the actual construction part portion of these projects and then CPP was also um, awarded 
um, additional funds for operations and support requirements um, for the, the current approved projects. So right now um, in region 10 only, we have five projects altogether. There's one in Pack Highway uh, in Washington, and then we have Port Hill in, in Idaho, and then we have Linden and Sumas in Washington as well. And then obviously we have Alcan in Alaska. But then I do, again, very much encourage everyone. GSA has a dedicated bipartisan infrastructure law construction projects webpage, and you're, you're not restricted to region 10. You can look at all of the other regions. It's broken down by state, and you can see what other projects under this BIL LPOE um, program um, you could see all the projects that are happening or happening right now, the status of those projects. And it's a, it's pretty helpful to, to know that. And I do encourage you again to, since you are in Region 10, please do visit our webpage and, and view all our current projects as well. All right. Thanks again for joining everyone. Um, if you've missed it, my name is Aaron Evanson. I am a Capital Project Manager with Region 10. And I'd like to start out just with the mission of CBP itself. So to protect the American people, safeguard the borders, and enhance the, the economic prosperity of the nation itself. That's the overarching goal of the Customs and Border Protection Agency. Then next slide. For those that don't know, Alcan is located just off of the border between Alaska and the Yukon. It's about five hours from Fairbanks and about seven hours from Anchorage. A majority of the land around there, um, a vast majority of it, is undeveloped forests and wetlands. It's the only 24-7 border station that services mainland Alaska from Canada. There are a couple other border stations uh, that serve Skagway and Haines but, uh, that are 24-7, uh, but those two other ports do not extend beyond those two locations. So in order to forget to get anywhere else from Haines or from Skagway, you've got to take a ferry. Um, this is the only border crossing station that Alaska has that you can transit through the entire mainland of Alaska itself. It was built in 1972 and the complex is a complete community in itself. It, op it houses operations. So it order, you know, the border, uh, the border station itself. It has services that supply the border station and it has housing where the officers and their families live and it has auxiliary buildings, such as a recreational building and a small playground for the children that are there and um, a couple of uh, storage buildings that are on that site as well. And in that picture in the top left-hand corner of the picture, you can actually see there is, um, it's, uh, it's actually a wastewater treatment facility that it serves that, uh, complex itself. So it's completely self-sustained. All the power and water are produced on site with wells and with generators, and the wastewater is actually treated on site as well. So next slide. So the purpose and the need of the project. It's always a, always a good topic to explore. So what needs to happen is we need to expand this port to accommodate additional staffing needs. CBP currently has 12 families on site and they need to increase that from to 15 to 19 to meet their operational needs for the coming decades. And, um, and we do plan on this facility lasting many, many years into the future. It'll improve the traffic flow and operations of the port building itself and the port operations. Uh, it'll update the housing comfort and efficiency. Again, those houses were built in 1972 and uh, being in a subarctic region like this, as many of you know, um, can really beat these structures down. It'll update technology and equipment, both in the housing and in the service buildings and in the port operations building itself. It'll reduce the carbon footprint. Um, again, built in 1972, these houses are not that energy efficient and the insulation and the envelopes need to be updated um, drastically. It'll also explore options for CBP and the Canada Border Service Agency to operate as a joint LPOE. For those that don't know, uh, CBPA, or, I'm sorry, CBSA has a port um, about 20 miles into the Yukon. It's called Beaver Creek. And uh, there's a current um, discussion between the Customs and Border Protection, the United States C uh, CBP and CBSA 
to actually use the Alcan as a joint operations location. Next slide. Right now we have two project alternatives. There was what's called a feasibility report that was published in 2019 that actually explored different areas around and on the Alcan Highway itself for a new um, complex for the port operations themselves. There, the two options that we boiled everything down to, the first one you'll see down at the bottom, and thank you for marking that up. I appreciate that, Ravi. That first option is the current location, and that's about a quarter mile off of the border. The second option, or the second alternative that we're looking at, is four miles north of the existing border at what some of you might know as the old Scotty Creek Lodge location. Scotty Creek Lodge burned down in the 1960s, and in its place, there was a gas station and a duty-free station that were erected. And that gas station has since been closed down as well. And right now, there's 10 acres of private land that are um, encompassing what those structures, uh, you know, the structures that used to be there and those uh, kind of defunct structures as of now. And so based on the geology that we could find and all the, the information, um, this was the second most viable option that we have for a new port location. So we're exploring both of those as part of this NEPA process. Next slide. Thanks, Robbie. This is just basically, uh, it's the same picture um, of the locations on the Alcan Highway, but this just shows you in relative, um, relative form where the Tetlin uh, National Wildlife Refu Refuge Visitor Center is and where the Border City Lodge is. Um, and then again, where the existing Alcan site is. So there's four miles going north between Alcan and the gas station. And then there's another two and a half miles north from the Tetlin Wildlife uh, Visitor Center. Next slide. The major elements of this project, no matter which site that they're going to, is to increase the square footage of the on-site residential housing. Like I said, CBP needs additional staffing on site. It'll include an indoor firing range so that the officers can maintain their proficiency, but um, not expose all of that lead and that gunpowder and everything else to the environment around it. It'll include a playground and a community center. And it'll include what's called an, a utilidor. It's an underground hallway that, that acts as both um, a connection point, an underground connection point between housing units and the, uh, the port building itself, the operations building. And it also conveys all of the services that are needed to make sure that we have domestic hot water, uh, domestic cold water, heating and cooling and uh, wastewater treatment or wastewater conveyance um, in between all of those uh, structures. So it will connect all the way from the port building to each one of the houses, and it will make sure that when it's negative 80 outside, the officers can actually get from their houses to the port building. It'll also include, as I said before, efficient building envelopes and help reduce the carbon footprint of that entire complex itself. So those are the major points of the, um, of the complex that we wanted to hit on. Sorry about that, Robbie. Thank you. <laughs> so this is our block plan diagram of how the on-site um, complex would be finally built out. Again, this is just schematic drawings. These are um, these are very tentative, and we are actually running through what's called a project development study, which further enhances these and builds out specifications for the construction of the buildings and all that kind of good stuff basically flushes out the entire thing so that we can send this out as a construction package. You'll notice in the blue are the housing units. In the green, in the center of those, is the recreational facility. In the orange are the service buildings. And in the red is the port operations building on the top. And then the bottom part is the indoor firing range. And you'll see nestled in there, there's a helicopter pad. And then that existing uh, wastewater treatment facility up on the top left corner is going to remain and we'll be using those. So this incorporates modernization of all of these facilities, the housing, the port building itself, the rec building and everything except the wastewater treatment facility um, is going to be upgraded and updated. 
and it will require the, the acquisition of about 10 acres of federal land. And that's where that helicopter pad are and the indoor firing range. It'll take some regrading of some of the hill that's on the south side of the Alcana Highway as well. Um, but those, um, that's all part of the construction process and we haven't finalized that yet. But we do know that we will need a little bit of additional space on the south side of the highway to incorporate some of those necessary facilities. Next slide. This is an overlay of that over the existing port building itself. And so you can see um, the right now on the south side of the highway, um, in this diagram, north is pointing up. So on the south side of the highway where the helicopter pad are and the um, firing range, uh, there's nothing there right now. So those will be fully built structures as well as the new port facility in red. Thank you. Next slide. This is our alternative site number two. And so this is actually um, part of that 10 acres of private land and 30 acres of state owned land that's uh, a little bit to the north of that privately owned land. And this would be a completely new facility um, with all of the utilidor, like I mentioned before, dug in place, um, new foundations, new structures, new wastewater treatment center, all of that would be brand new at this location. Next slide. And here's that overlay again, just to give an idea. Um, for anyone that's actually familiar with the site, there's a there's a existing gravel pit mining facility that's just to the north of this. You can just see it peeking out of that left-hand side. Um, and then all the housing will be located um, off of the highway a little bit in the blue. The new recreational building and support facility will be in the green again. The services buildings will be in the orange. And then the firing range is the long skinny one right there. And then the port, new port building, which would be located adjacent to the highway, is the last one down there on the bottom. Next slide, thanks. Thank you very much. That's all I have for you right now. Leon, take it away. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, it is a major federal action. Uh, the, this uh, proposal at the LPOE on the Alcan is subject to the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, as we call it. And uh, NEPA requires every federal agency to consider the impacts of their proposed actions on the human environment. And by human environment, we mean both the natural environment, such as wetlands, forests, endangered species, soils, and the social and economic environment that might potentially be affected by one or more of these actions. So the agency responsibilities under NEPA include considering a, a group of reasonable alternatives, reasonable ways of uh, carrying out the project, options is another term for it, and also uh, considering public input throughout the NEPA process. Uh, and this is the beginning of that tonight with our so-called uh, scoping meeting, online scoping meeting, whereby we are establishing the scope of the project, what it consists of, what the purpose and need are, what alternatives might be. We have some preliminary ones as, as we've shared with you already, and uh, what sort of resource areas are worth analyzing in the document. Next, Ravi. So GSA has to comply with other relevant laws, statutes, and regulations, and executive orders and as part of complying with NEPA. And there are three of them that uh, come up every time. One of them is the Endangered Species Act, Section 7 in particular, which requires federal agencies to uh, look at the potential impact on so-called federally listed species of their proposed action and alternatives. A second of those three is Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, which requires federal agencies to look at the potential impacts on waters of the United States, including wetlands connected with those waters, uh, and to consult with the U.S. Army 
Corps of Engineers in doing so. The Corps has jurisdiction over those so-called uh, jurisdictional wetlands and, and waters. And then finally, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, which we'll be describing, Kim will be describing in a bit more detail after I finish. Next, Robbie. So here's a, a conceptual diagram or schematic of the NEPA process, starting with the notice of intent, which was filed in, in recent weeks. It's actually published in the Federal Register, uh, daily publication of the US government. Uh, then we get into the scoping, which as I mentioned, is establishing what the scope of the analysis is going to be with public input. Then we actually analyze, do the analysis, after which we, relieved, we release the draft environmental impact statement or EIS to the public. There's a 45 day minimum public review period after the release of the EIS and uh, comments will be submitted by uh, members of the public, agencies with some jurisdiction or interest, what we call stakeholders in general. And then those are considered and have to be responded to. Finally, uh, a final EIS will be issued and then a record of decision or ROD concludes the process. Next. So the purpose of scoping is to gather input, suggestions from the public and agencies that have an interest in this project on the proposed development, which is the modernized LPOE on the Alcan. So your comments, your, your written comments, help us uh, with uh, the development of alternatives and deciding which, uh, which areas of the environment need to be investigated in the EIS. Uh, next. So uh, this diagram uh, shows us the four major components or contents of an EIS, purpose and need, alternatives, affected environment, and environmental consequences. The purpose and need, which we've already described, is what we are trying to achieve, what, uh, what uh, GSA is trying to achieve in modernizing or building a new LPOE along the Alcan. Alternatives are different ways of, uh, of uh, pursuing that purpose and need. And we've outlined three preliminary ones here already. Uh, affected environment uh, lays out those aspects of the environment that might potentially be affected by one or more of the alternatives. And then the last one of environmental consequences uh, predicts what those environmental effects will actually be. Again, alternative by alternative. Sometimes alternatives will have very similar or identical environmental consequences or impacts, and sometimes they'll differ quite drastically. Next, Ravi. So uh, uh, Aaron already mentioned this, but the purpose in general is to modernize and expand, that has increased the size and the capacity of the LCAN LPOE. And then the need, is to uh, meet CBP's operational needs for the port, uh, provide ideal operational flow, address uh, problems that are existing right now, such things as uh, energy inefficiency and so forth, improve customer service to travelers along the Alcan, and provide a comfortable and safe living and working environments for CBP personnel and their families. Next. So the EIS right now will be considering two action alternatives and one no action alternative. The two action alternatives as Aaron uh, uh, described them will uh, consist of one on the site that will renovate and expand the LPOE at its existing location. And then alternative two would have a different location approximately four miles away, uh, further away from the border with the Yukon Territory and an, an entirely new LPOE on that acquired site. And then NEPA always requires us to examine what's called the no action alternative. And in the case of existing programs or projects or facilities like this, that typically means not just walking away and having nothing there at all, but rather continuing to do things in the way that they are right now with the existing facilities 
and uh, say the existing maintenance uh, regimen that uh, the existing LPOE has in place already. So those are the three alternatives. Uh, the third step, as I mentioned earlier, looks at the affected environment, water quality and water quantity, fisheries, wildlife, air quality, uh, traffic conditions in, in the vicinity. Um, it will also look at the broader human environment. What are the economic effects of construction and operation of the LPOE? So a human environment is construed in NEPA really pretty much includes everything under the sun, both the natural and biophysical environments and the human environment that is connected to those. Next. And then finally, environmental consequences involves projecting or predicting what the impacts of all three of the action, of all three of the proposed, all three of the alternatives, the two action and the one no action alternative will be on different aspects of the environment. As we mentioned before, water quality, quantity, the human environment, um, noise levels, and so forth. And typically, we analyze those effects using four criteria. The magnitude criterion is how much, how large, how intensive that effect is. Duration or frequency refers to how long it is, whether it's constant, whether it's intermittent or sporadic. Does it last just the duration of construction or will it last, in, last indefinitely as long as the, the new LPOE is there? The extent refers to sort of the footprint of, of the project, but with something like noise, it can extend beyond that. Or air quality, it can extend beyond that as well, beyond the physical footprint on the ground. And then the likelihood refers to the probability that a, a given type of impact has of occurring. And we use typically pr professional judgment and, and uh, looking at how likely a given impact is. Next. So the next steps after, after scoping, uh, we'll, we'll be getting into the draft EIS analysis, as I mentioned, uh, looking at the analysis of potential um, impacts on given resource areas, such as fish and wildlife, forests, soils, water, and so forth. Uh, when the when the draft when when that's complete and we have a draft EIS that will be released to the public for a 45 day comment period during which we'll be having another uh, public online meeting like this to receive comments and those uh, can be given during the course of that meeting or submitted and everything from snail mail to the website to email so a variety of ways of doing that. We incorporate those comments into the draft EIS as we're converting it into the final EIS. And we will delineate the comments. Say we receive 17 com uh, uh, comments from 17 different commenters and each of those commenters has more than one comment. There may be a hundred comments overall. Each one of those will be delineated or teased apart and then responded to in the final EIS. If necessary, changes will be made to the final EIS from the draft EIS to um, respond to those comments. If, if there's new information or a new type of analysis that needs to be done, that would occur in the final EIS. Next. And then after the publication of that final EIS or FEIS, uh, uh, we will consider public input again, and there will be a minimum 30 day waiting period after which GSA will issue a, an, a ROD, a record of decision. This ROD lets the public know that a decision has been made and what the underlying justification or rationale for that decision uh, might be. And this includes consideration of cost, practicality, agency mission, and potential environmental impacts of an action. Uh, for those who may not know, NEPA does not dictate any final option or, or alternative being chosen. Uh, you don't have to select the, the agency, the lead agency, GSA in this case, doesn't have to necessarily select what is sometimes called the environmentally preferable alternative, right? Uh, because there are other factors that weigh in on this. So NEPA requires us to analyze these potential impacts and then divulge the results of that impact to the public, which is encouraged to participate in the process. Next. 
And uh, with that, I'll pass the baton on. Thank you, Leon. Let me know if you can hear me, everybody. Yes. Thank you. It's hard to tell these days. Uh, my name is Kim Gingat. I'm the Regional Historic Preservation Officer for GSA Region 10. And it is my job to make sure that GSA takes into account cultural resources uh, in planning of these projects. So um, like uh, they said at the beginning, NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act and other regulations also come into play here. The National Historic Preservation Act is the, is the law that I work with most of the time. It often happens alongside of NEPA. So we often talk about them at the same time at, at the same public meetings because it does have a public component as well. Um, the, the process is to identify historic and cultural resources and make sure they are taken into consideration. Um, so then the part of the, the, the purpose is uh, of us coming today is to, to ask the public to help us identify any historic or cultural resources that may be important to you. Um, this would be, you know, it could be a building, a structure, an archaeological site, an object, a ceremonial site, cultural landscape, anything that you think might be affected by a project uh, that we are doing, um, you can let us know about it. Uh, the National Historic Preservation Act uh, requires us to identify any cultural resources that are in our project area. So, and we also uh, are reaching out to uh, Alaska Native Village partners as well, and that uh, outreach is ongoing. Um, also, in addition to the National Historic Preservation Act, GSA as a federal agency has uh, an obligation to our tribal uh, sovereign nations. Um, so that is also an ongoing consultation. Uh, you can go to the next one, Robbie. So just briefly, uh, the way that the National Historic Preservation Act works um, is first we have to determine, you know, if there's any historic properties present in our project area. And so the way we do that is we do a cultural resources survey. Uh, we are in the process of preliminary cultural resource investigations. Um, and the next step, if we if we if we determine there are cultural resources in our project area, then the next step is to determine how or if they may be affected. And if they may be affected, we would you know do anything we could to avoid or minimize adversely affecting them. If that was not possible due to whatever circumstances, um, then a, a mitigation type scenario would would develop, and with agreement among all the parties that are affected. So. Section 106 doesn't, you know, necessarily dictate an outcome either. Um, it's a consultative process that uh, that if if there are effects to historic properties, there will be some mitigation involved. So we hope that doesn't happen. Uh, we don't know uh, right now of any historic properties within our project areas, but like I said, we are in the preliminary phases and we are counting on uh, folks in Alaska to help us out with that. So if you have any comments about cultural resources, please do let us know. Thank you, and that's it for this one. Okay, so I will start. I wanted to also let everyone know that there will be future opportunities to provide your input. So as you look at the first comment arrow, or comment here arrow, we have um, the one that we're in right now. This is our very first uh, public scoping meeting. And the and I think if you, well, not I think, it, it is in the, the press release and in the, the notices that went out as well and on our project website that all comments are due by May 15th. So I, we wanted to provide time for everyone just to, to obviously come to this presentation and then review any handouts and then also you know do your own research as well and you'll be able to um, hopefully make any comments or feedback that you wanna to provide to us. And then you also have another opportunity as well when the draft environmental impact statement is ready, that'll be in the form of a uh, notice of availability, which will be published in the federal register as well. And then we'll also have an, um, a public meeting as well to go over um, the draft EIS itself. Next slide, please. And then so now to go over options for submitting public comments. The right now, and I know Ro uh, Robbie has posted it in the chat and hopefully you have access to it. You can scroll up uh, um, to hopefully download that and you, don't have, you didn't have any issues, but you can fill out, it's a Google form that you can fill out 
And um, there is no word limit on there. It's just ask a few questions. It's pretty open-ended. So to allow people um, to be able to, to write freely as they feel. And then you can also speak now during the meeting um, itself. So if you, you feel comfortable, if you wanna, you have any questions for us at all, please do. I hope you do feel comfortable, but please ask questions now. Um, uh, we'd appreciate that too. And then we also have an email, um, an alcan, L-P-O-E, at gsa.gov. It was set up specifically for the, um, the Alcan project. So please utilize that as well as much as you need to. Just make sure in the subject line that you put Alcan, L-P-O-E, E-I-S. And then you can also mail your um, comments as well. But just in here, same thing. You want to do attention, Emily Grimes. And then for uh, it's the U.S. General Services Administration, we're located at 1301 A Street, Suite 610 in Tacoma, Washington, 98402. And then I'll, hopefully you can see it a little bit better. But for press inquiries only, we also have, um, please do contact Christy chidester Vodasek, And her information is there as well with her phone number and her email address. So at this time, um, I, we would like, we'll, we'll check the chat. I didn't see anything come through the chat, but we'll, we'll check that. And then also just open it up to, to anyone that does want to say anything. You can use the, the emojis. If you, I think we have a raise hand emoji or reaction if, that, if that's possible. Thank you, Rick. Hopefully I'm not just, my audio is off and no one is speaking right now. It's quiet. Uh, Susan, would you like to talk? Feel free to unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually don't have comments. I just have some some questions if that's okay. Perfectly fine. Okay, great. Um, so I was curious if you could talk a little bit about um, the proposal to have the um, land port of entry relocated. Was there, I'm just, I'm just wondering if there's just some, um, if there are specific, um, if there's like attractiveness or if, if what, what the perks are, if you will, like what kind of made you decide to uh, to potentially relocate the land port of entry. I'm just wondering if there's like cost savings or time savings or reduction with impacts, but I'm just trying to under have a better understanding of um, the, the decision behind uh, including a, a relocated port of entry facility. I can take that one. Um, that's a really good question, Susan. Uh, so when we did the feasibility study and looked at the difference between staying on site or moving, one of the huge draws of actually moving off site is that we can keep all of the housing on site. We wouldn't have to stage it separately or move people out as we're trying to rebuild that housing. And also it keeps the port operations functional 24 seven uh, without having to, again, build temporary facilities at the border station now or try and phase the construction differently. We can start from, str from scratch and we can build the whole thing while everybody uh, that is associated with the um, border crossing as of right now, all the officers and their family, they don't get displaced. And so building a whole, a, a whole brand new site is actually from a phasing standpoint preferred. Um, because like I said, we wouldn't have to relocate people. We wouldn't have to um, pause any kind of operations at the port itself, or we wouldn't have to figure out how to phase all that stuff. Um, you know, over multiple seasons, and um, and 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 then we could pick up and move everybody when everything's done, and then demo that existing site. Um, and we are still in discussions um, with the Department of Natural Resources and everything else about how we would transition that existing site. Um, but that's uh, for another year. To be perfectly honest, we've got we've got a lot of time until that's happening. So we're, um, we have started the conversations and everything else like that, but that's the biggest thing. First is the phasing of it. And the second is just the continuity of operations for CBP themselves. 
So does that push the project back if there's a second site? It extends the project. Um, yeah. on, our, on our preliminary estimates, we would be able to be done with a complete facility on the on the uh, yet at the offsite location, in, um, by about 2028, um, and it looks like right now, um, and these are very preliminary estimates, but we wouldn't be done with the current location until about 2030. Got it. And again, that's because we would have to phase things differently. We would have to figure out how to make sure that we have the continuity of operations, bring any temporary housing or temporary structures for those facilities while we're build, rebuilding them. So it just makes it a little bit more difficult. And as as uh, some folks here might know, um, there's only about a three to four month building season at Alcan because of the temperatures and because of the subarctic, uh, you know, the climate that we have there. Good question, Susan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's that's helpful. And if if no one does want to speak or has other questions, I just have a couple of other questions as well. But I'll I'll just pause for a moment. I don't want to I don't want to hog up the time. <laughs> I think you're good, Susan. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm curious. You mentioned that you're in current discussions with um, co-locating um, operations with Canada Border Service um, Agency, and I was curious how that could, if that does happen, how that potentially impacts the footprint construction. Like, how do things change from what you currently propose? Sorry, I was on mute. That's another great question. <laughs> um, at this point in time, these these discussions are very st pre preliminary still, and the but both governments, uh, Canada and the United States, are talking about how that kind of policy would um, affect joint operations. Um, typically speaking, the U.S. and Canada have shared border operations in the past, but those usually span the border, and um, one half of the build the building is built over the border itself, and one half of the building is in Canada, and one half of the building is in the United States. And Canadian officers operate on the Canada side, and U.S. officers operate on the U.S. side. And so, one um, that's one of the policy issues that we're we're going to be working out with CBSA is what does it mean to have full time Canadian officers operating on U.S. soil. Um, it's a very good question, and it's something that we've talked about, but both Canada and the U.S. are very interested in making this a joint operation. As far as the facility itself, it's not going to change drastically. There's going to be some requirements that both CBP will have and CBSA will have, and there might be some uh, small amount of square footage that they can't share. But one of our focuses on this is to actually treat this as a fully co-located location. So as opposed to CBP having specific areas that are only for CBP and CBSA having only areas that are for CBSA, we're trying to, we're trying to mash those. We're trying to make sure that we're looking at this as holistically as possible and determining all of the spaces that can be shared. Um, at this point in time, we are not expecting that CBSA's families of the officers would be moving to that location. So it would only be operational personnel that are there for a short period of time, as opposed to the CBP families that are living there. The CBSA families will still live in Beaver, Beaver Creek and the officers will travel that 20 miles um, from Beaver Creek to Alcan to actually do their work. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that was super helpful. Thank you. And no so, problem. yeah, and I was just trying to understand uh, the relationship too. And because the land port of entry is away from the border, this this project doesn't require like a Department of State presidential permit, right? Or does it? I don't know that answer. Um, there, are, there are existing documents and there we have some precedent for this um because there are for example there are u.s customs and border protection officers that work out of the vancouver airport the vancouver bc airport for example 
um, and they do what's called a preclearance. And so we're taking that precedent of the preclearance and we're actually looking to apply it towards this facility. Um, there are limitations on that preclearance that have already been you know, uh, discussed and approved by both governments. Um, and so we're gonna have to work through some of those. But um, even though this is a different avenue, um, because like I said, those preclearances normally operate at airports and railroads, um, they haven't been applied to land ports of entry or border stations as they're more normally called. Um, especially one that's fully on U.S. soil. So, like I said, we have precedents um, with the airports, but we need to work on that policy as far as it associates with the border station itself. Susan, uh, this is Leon here. I've, I've worked on uh, EISs for the U.S. Department of Energy that involved looking at transmission lines coming from Canada into the United States. And so here is a major piece of public energy infrastructure crossing the border, right? And yes, those did require presidential permits. And I think that's what the, uh, that was the, that was the action that uh, was being investigated or that was the NEPA nexus or linkage. I don't think, as Aaron was saying, I don't think this would fall into that same category as something that is exclusively on the US side of the border. Okay, great. Thank you. And then um, I think my final question is is about whether or not uh, the project requires any um, improvement to existing infrastructure, like, for example, would Federal Highways Administration or Alaska a Department of Transportation get involved? Um, are there going to be improvements or changes to, to the highway? And then I'm also curious, and, and I think you might have answered my question, like if it is potentially relocated, that doesn't change where you're crossing the border, right? You would still just be going in the same direction. It just would be further away or in a different location. But I was just curious about uh, other infrastructure and whether or not any of that would have to be improved or expanded upon or relocated. And, and again, like whether or not there are other federal agencies besides like the Corps of Engineers um, that would be involved in the decision and potentially doing a NEPA or being like a cooperating agency or adopting your document? From my understanding, Susan, um, aside from slight variations in the highway itself, in the location or the, um, or the current routing of the highway, there might be some changes to that, but it would be very minimal in the sense that it would be on the footprint of the uh, of the facility itself. So we might have to reroute some, um, you know, some some entry lanes, and uh, in order to fit one example that I can think of right now is um, very slight rerouting of the highway at the border if we do stay in the current location to accommodate that new port operations building. Um, but again, these are very preliminary design decisions. The feasibility study was in some senses made in a vacuum because we didn't have the NEPA study to build that feasibility study off of. So there's still a lot of exploration that we have that's associated with this. Um, and some of that is uh, any community uh, involvements that are required, any, um, any input, again, like you said, from both state and federal agencies as far as uh, as road or roadbed or drainage, all that kind of stuff, the, the, the necessary improvements to be done based off of either one of those locations. Um, we still don't have the um, preliminary findings on environmental impacts at that old gas station. Um, you know, that might preclude us from actually building in that location. If there's underground storage tanks that are blooming, you know, if they're leaking, um, we don't know that. And that's part of the NEPA study. And that all of the all of that information, a lot of that information that you asked about will be flushed out through the NEPA study. Great. Thank you for all of the helpful information. I appreciate it. Of course. Any other questions? I'm happy to field them. I'm here. Emily's here. We've got all sorts of people on. 
I also just wanted to mention really quick that I dropped a link in the chat for everybody. It is a link to a Google form, which is our online version of the comment form. Please feel free to fill it out online if you would like. Um, it will all go to the same place. So thanks, guys. That's great, Robbie. Thank you. Well, I know we we presented quite a bit today and in it, you know, I want everybody to just soak everything in and hopefully when we get the presentation posted, you you feel you want to rewatch it again or you can fast forward in this time. But um, also the handouts, hopefully those are helpful. And please, again, just, you know, you can email email us at that alcan, lpoe at gsa.gov email address and um, pretty much the majority of the GSA staff is on, not the majority, the team, the GSA team handling these projects are on there and we'll respond to you um, pretty quickly um, uh, in email as well. But, but again, you know, I wanna appreciate everyone for taking the time for joining and please do share um, as well with your colleagues or with your neighbors and your, or your friends. And like I said before, anybody that you feel that wasn't able to be here. Thank you. And then, so Robbie, I wanna ask um, if you've been, well, I know you were keeping track. Did anybody join after we got started since then or pretty much everyone was on here? Just yeah, so we know we need to go through. There were a few folks that joined uh, a couple of slides in, but for the most okay. part, it was here. Okay. And then for those that, if you did join in, you know, a few slides in, please let us know. Just unmute yourself if you want us to go back to any slide. Um, we'll gladly do that. We we ended a lot sooner than we thought we would. We have a whole hour left that we slotted. And we have a question from Susan. Robbie, it's regarding uh, the draft EIS. I saw that. Give me one second to pull up the schedule so I can give you the right answer. <laughs> Alrighty, it is scheduled for May of 2024. No problem. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, I was just saying that we we will be staying on, um, but please feel free to log off. It looks like 
we got we still have a few people on there um just waiting just to see if anybody just decides to register and join during this time frame and they weren't able to make it earlier <laughs>